webcasting? Okay. It's in camera. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome um, everyone to our electronic council meeting. Due to COVID-19 pandemic, regional council is practicing physical distancing and councillors are participating electronically. I will now ask the deputy clerk, Leanne Wetzel, to do roll call. Good morning, everyone. Chair Redman. Here. Councillor Armstrong. Here. Councillor Clark. Here. Councillor Erb. Here. Councillor Foxton. Present. Councillor Galloway. Present. Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Councillor Jaworski. Here. Councillor Jowett. Councillor Jowett. Councillor Kiefer. Here. Councillor Lorenz. Here. Councillor McGarry. Here. Councillor Nowak. Here. Councillor Schantz. Here. Councillor Strickland. Councillor Strickland. And Councillor Verbanovic. Councillor Verbanovic. So all present except for Councillors Harris, Jowett, Strickland, and Verbanovic. Uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest under the Conflict of Interest Act? Uh, Madam Chair, I just wanted a clarification. You introduced the meeting as a meeting of council. Is this the this is the Board of Health, right? You're right. Thank you, Councillor Galloway. This we are meeting. Um, we are regional council and we have quorum, but we are meeting in our capacity as the Board of Health. So thank you for that clarification. Thank you. With that clarification, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, um, Mr. Lochner, do you want to introduce this or should we go right to Dr. Long? Okay, uh, Dr. Wong, you have the floor uh, for a COVID-19 verbal update. Welcome. Thank you, uh, uh, Chair Redman, and, and good morning, everyone. Um, I, um, I have a few slides, and uh, Kathy Prosh will, uh, will help me by forwarding the slides as I speak. Uh, thank you. Um, so we can go to the next slide, Kathy. So yeah, so I would like to um, uh, provide an update on the current status of COVID in, in, in the region, uh, talk a little about local and provincial trends with a focus on fitness and sports activities, as well as workplaces. And then finally, um, close with uh, recommendations uh, for Waterloo Region at this time. So if we go to the next slide, So before I begin, uh, just a note about a change to the daily reporting on our dashboard, which will start tomorrow. So due to the uh, new provincial case and contact data system that uh, all health units have to eventually be on, um, positive case information is automatically entered into our data system at all hours of the day. So in order to avoid the constant updating of the previous day's numbers, the COVID-19 dashboard will now be refreshed at 1.30 p.m. daily instead of 10.30 a.m. daily and will contain data up to midnight of the previous day instead of up to 5 p.m. of the previous day. So this change will make our reporting more timely and it will help clarify our daily totals better. So if I go back to the slide now, um, this is our epi curve. Um, and at this time, our rate of new cases is not accelerating. Our rate of new cases is approximately 17 per 100,000 per week. The average rate of new cases for Ontario 
is 37 per 100,000 per week. The highest rates are in areas such as Toronto, Ottawa, Peel, and now York, with rates between 50 and 70 per 100,000 per week. In Waterloo Region, the seven-day moving average of percent positivity of tests has recently fluctuated between 1 and 1.2% and therefore has not increased beyond the 1.2% the, the 1 that I mentioned at my last update a couple of weeks ago. So this is another indication that infection rates have not continued to accelerate in our community at this time. This is largely due to the efforts of our residents in Waterloo Region, for which I'm grateful. That said, we do remain in a precarious state, similar to other mid-sized regions in Ontario. Some other mid-sized regions, uh, due to their increases in rates, are being monitored by the province. So we need to remain diligent with our public health practices. If we go to the next slide, please, called current trends. So locally, we continue to see our highest case growth in the 20 to 29 and 10 to 19 year old age groups. But cases are also increasing among middle-aged adults and starting to creep up among older adults. Our number of case, uh, our number of care homes, I'm sorry, under outbreak has started to trend up. So currently there are seven outbreaks in long-term care and retirement homes. Our number of hospitalizations while remaining low has also started to gradually increase. We are currently at six hospitalizations. We have not had additional deaths in wave two to date. And our outbreaks to date in care homes, in work settings and in schools have remained well controlled. Taking a look at the picture provincially, Late last week, the province indicated that it has seen a steady increase in hospitalizations. It has also continued to see clusters associated with large social gatherings, including indoor birthday parties, family and friend gatherings, and household to household visit gatherings. And they have also seen outbreaks and exposures in gym and sports settings, such as basketball, volleyball, hockey, and an increase in outbreaks in long-term care homes and retirement homes. And similar to what's been noted before, provincially as well as locally, many public health units continue to report that the number of contacts per case remains high and cluster investigations or investigations of cases continue to involve many locations and businesses. If we go to the next slide called fitness and sport activities, slide one of two. In light of increased risks being observed in Ontario, for example, um, the SPINCO outbreak in Hamilton and other outbreak or risk situations observed elsewhere in Ontario, the province is reviewing the risk associated with gym and fitness facilities to determine whether additional public health measures may be required. Provincially, as well as locally, also seen situations of increased risk in recreational group sport activities. 
There have been outbreaks elsewhere in Ontario, as I mentioned, volleyball, basketball, etc. And locally, although we haven't had any outbreaks yet, we have had cases where multiple teammates have had to self-isolate because of physical activity in close contact with cases and without masks because they were playing a sport. So while we await the results of the provincial review, I am providing the following advice. First, general principles applicable to any setting. One, close contact with immediate household members only. That means contact uh, within six feet and without masks with, with household members only. Two, distance and mask with everyone else. Three, outside is safer than inside and four, stick to smaller groups. Smaller is safer. If we go to the next slide, please. More specific advice applicable to fitness and sports settings. One, consider expanding online offerings, such as online fitness classes. Two, consider physical distance greater than six feet for fitness activities with high intensity. That is with rapid inhalation and deep ex exhalation and or large range of movement. At a minimum, exercise squares or circles for people to move about should be at least six feet apart from edge to edge. So people exercising within those circles or squares do not have an opportunity to get closer than six feet to others within their own squares or circles. Number three, ensure good ventilation and bring in fresh air. Bring in fresh air by maximizing the outdoor air ratio of the facility's HVAC system or by opening windows. If this is not possible or practical for the whole facility, focus those measures in places where crowding may be an issue and areas used for group exercise and avoid recirculation of air as far as practically possible. Four, ensure sufficient contact time for disinfectant products. In addition to using disinfectant products that have a drug identification number, DIN, and have been approved by Health Canada, ensure sufficient contact time for the, for the products being used. A product with a longer contact time will require more waiting time between users. So choosing a product with a shorter contact time that is appropriate for the services being disinfected will ensure an effective disinfection between users. And last but not least, no shouting, no loud music. Instructors should consider the use of microphones to support physical distancing and avoid the need to raise their voices or shout. And patrons should not be permitted to sing along to the music or shout back at the instructor. <clears throat> If we go to the next slide, please. Workplaces. So last Friday, I shared observations public health has made in workplaces and facilities while doing case and contact follow-up. What we've noticed is that workplaces overall are serious about ensuring appropriate public health measures, in particular in areas where clients or patrons may be present. What we've also noticed, however, is that public health precautions are not always applied or not consistently applied 
in employee-only areas. Last Friday, last Friday, I offered advice for common areas where we've identified least risk, including workers carpooling together, workers coming to work while sick, and workers not maintaining physical distancing in employee-only areas, such as in lunch rooms, break rooms, and meeting rooms. So these increased risks in employee-only areas have been seen across the province, which is why the provincial face covering legislation extends into indoor workplace settings now, and why the Ministry of Labor is hiring more ins inspectors and doing more workplace inspections. Therefore, as a reminder, it, it is important for employers and employees to stay vigilant with all recommended COVID measures at all times in order to prevent spread and reduce the risk of workplace outbreaks and business closures. Workplace outbreaks can also increase community spread. So going to my last slide now, in conclusion, what do we need to do? First, as a reminder, what we're trying to achieve Slow the spread of COVID in order to prevent an escalation that can quickly spiral as we've seen elsewhere in Ontario and necessitate the need for significant closures. In order to keep schools and businesses open, to keep medical procedures and surgeries continuing and to prevent severe restrictions in long-term care and other vulnerable settings as much as we can. So what do we need to do Five things, avoid close contact outside of your immediate household. Physically distance and wear a face covering with everyone else. This includes with family members outside of your immediate household, with friends that you know, and with people that you are working with or studying with. Three, stay at home and away from others when you are ill. Make an appointment to be tested. Four, keep the gatherings as small as possible. And five, use outdoor spaces as much as possible. In closing, what are the region's residents' efforts have moderated our growth in cases to date? Thank you very much to our community for all their efforts. Let's continue, let's keep going so we can reduce risks for those in our long-term care homes and other vulnerable settings, so we can keep our schools and businesses opened and our medical procedures and surgery, surgeries continuing. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take questions after uh, Lee Fairclough um, has some remarks, I believe. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Wong has suggested that we hold our questions till after um, Lee Fairclough uh, speaks, so I'll uh, go over to um, Mr. Lochner to introduce Lee. Thanks to you, Madam Chair. Um, I think most of you know Lee in her capacity as president of St. Mary's General Hospital, but uh, a bit of quick history. Lee um, was a senior leader with uh, Health Quality Ontario and actually came to this region many, many years ago to help us start something called Collaborative Quality Improvement Plan. So, in short, a number of health service providers like hospitals and long-term care homes and so on were charged with creating improvement plans around, uh, around quality in their organizations and uh, leave it to a region like Waterloo to actually do this collaboratively and bring multiple organizations together to create the province's first collaborative improvement plans. And Lee was uh, one of the key architects of that, so she knows this area well. I was absolutely thrilled when Lee took on the uh, presidency of St. Mary's Hospital, and Lee has been a driving force along with Shu Lee and Sharon Ball um, in our COVID response. So uh, very heroic work, Lee, and, and over to you. Welcome, Lee. Good morning and thank you very much uh, to the members of Board of Health for welcoming me here this morning and, and I do just want to give a big thank you and underscore the collaboration that has occurred, uh, certainly with my colleague Dr. Wong and Bruce Lochner, but many of you around this table and many of your teams as well that work with you. So I just want to say, you know, how uh, what a joy it's been actually to come to this community 
um, and feel that spirit through such an unusual time for us all. Um, um, Bruce had asked that I come today to provide a bit of an overview of where we are in our progress on testing uh, in the region. Um, this is really one of many aspects of our COVID-19 response and as a triad that uh, Bruce highlighted myself as the hospital lead in that triad, um, really we've tried to build this system of assessment and testing and of course, uh, the processing of those results as we've gone through this pandemic in many ways. So what I, what I plan to do was provide a, a, bit, a few remarks just to frame where are we today currently? And then as I understand that there, there may be some questions that some of you may have, um, and uh, you know, I'm happy to entertain those of course uh, at the end. Um, you know, when I think back to March, and when this all began in our region, um, you know, I, I really think about, and I think about testing and, and what we were trying to accomplish at that time is a very different point in time. Um, first of all, we were looking at how we were going to get the supplies we needed to do testing. Uh, were we going to have the swabs? Were we going to have reagents? And the testing approach was very, very limited at the beginning and largely focused on testing those that were coming into hospitals. And of course, then also rapidly evolved into ensuring that we could test um, our healthcare workers and other essential workers. And, you know, within a matter of weeks, um, we were setting up new services in this region. We were setting up assessment centers and test, testing centers. We were defining what those were. Um, and this community really rallied together to support that initiative. Um, we set up centers associated with the hospitals, but I also think in this community in particular, primary care stepped forward to support us in establishing uh, those testing capabilities. And of course, we work very closely with our colleagues in public health throughout that for how, how this testing should occur and how it would occur. Where are we today? Well, today we target testing more than, we, we target more than 50,000 tests a day in the province. That translates to about 2,500 per day in the Waterloo Wellington region. And of course the region of Waterloo itself is a, is a big part of that. Um, you know, we've learned a lot about the virus over that time. And, and as a result, we've seen changes in, in some of the testing expectations. But we've also learned that testing is not just about giving access to a test to, to a, a place where we can take the test, but actually how do we route that through a lab? How do we ensure that we get timely results? And how do we make sure that those results are, are accessible to those that need them, either through public health, through family physicians and other providers, and of course, directly to the individuals that are being tested. So it really has been, um, you know, a tremendous response when we look at that. Um, certainly it's had its bumps along the ways <laughs> and certainly we've had to be nimble in how we've responded to it. But when I think about where, where we've come to today, um, you know, I, I think a lot has changed. In terms of the testing component of this, you know, um, in terms of the assessment centers and testing centers that we currently have available, um, if I could just, Kathy, could I trouble you to just move to the next slide for a minute? This is a, just a visual of the current assessment centers that are available across our region and some of what we defined as satellites and testing uh, um, spokes that are connected to those centers. For this region, we've established assessment and testing centers at Grand River Hospital through the drive-through mechanism at St. Mary's Hospital and the KW4 assessment center. And of course, in Cambridge as well, uh, through the testing center that they've had there. We've also established collaborations, mostly with family uh, practices that exist in other communities that are available a couple of days a week to ensure that there could be some local testing and all of it has been set up in close collaboration with an existing center. As we moved into the fall, our campuses looked into how they were gonna start to meet some of the needs of their students. And those campus assessment centers, which really were developed through the university system, um, you know, have also provided testing for students on site at their student services areas. Do you mind going back one slide, Kathy? Thank you. 
So that has been, I think probably some of you may even have experienced that. Those are our systems where you can come in, you can now book an appointment and you'll come in and, and you'll have a test done. We've also had community-based outreach approaches though. The paramedics uh, have really served the community. Our community paramedics program has been absolutely critical to serving those that are unable to come in person to assessment centers um, for a variety of different reasons. And as we move certainly into schools and other areas, ensuring that we could support uh, children in that process as well. Um, we've had an amazing program in the region of Waterloo to support the homeless, um, the Sanguine Bus and the strategy that was put together to support at risk in the shelter system uh, through the Radisson, in my opinion, has been absolutely remarkable. Uh, it has been something that I've certainly shared with my provincial colleagues as well from my previous work as just a leading example of, of being very proactive and, you know, avoiding cases within a in a population that it was, you know, very seriously at risk through through this pandemic. And then the other thing that we've done is supported outreach. And these outreach teams have included our paramedics, but they've also included some of our family physicians and others that have gone out to support settings as they've gone into outbreak um, or to serve more specific communities where we've had to have pop-up um, examples of testing. We've spoken already a little bit to the campus assessment centers. The most recent development, of course, have been the pharmacies. And I would say up until the, the introduction of the pharmacies, the expectation was that all of the load and all of the testing needs could be met through these mechanisms that I've described to you above. The pharmacies have come in now and they, are, they of course, are supporting that need for asymptomatic testing. Uh, largely, and those that are looking to be tested that are outside of the parameters of those that may have symptoms, maybe a high-risk contact, or maybe uh, need to be tested because of some of the, the ministry-directed testing programs. But they're starting to serve a, a, another population that, that were certainly in need of testing. And then finally, the other aspect of this, of course, is the testing that's needed within service provider organizations, including hospitals. Um, and there's been interesting decisions that we've had to make about does every patient get tested before they have a procedure, before they come into hospital. And those two fluctuate and those two impact our ability to meet those testing requirements. You know, throughout this time, uh, no question, there's been a lot of changing requirements and that's because we've learned a lot about the virus as we've gone. Um, and, you know, I think that um, we have been very responsive in the region. Um, it's, we've got an amazing forum across all of our assessment and testing centers. They come together at a minimum weekly, if not more frequently, to talk about how we're responding to new requirements Good examples have been the move to uh, enable people to come in and self-refer and have walk into our centers to the most recent, which was once we saw the volume that we had, we needed to adjust to systems of being able to pre-book appointments and make sure that we're seeing those that needed testing uh, in a very timely way. Uh, we've, as we've looked at some of the priorities um, and as we've approached wave two, you know, support the opening of schools, we saw a lot of demand come forward on the testing centers, which we've worked to respond to. And of course, now, uh, as we as we really move into wave two and what this means, um, and as a health system, we've got goals to keep as much open as we can. What will that mean for our testing strategies? Finally, I wanted to make just a few comments on our lab system. Um, the lab system in Ontario is a big part of this, and it is exactly that. We have created a lab system <laughs> in Ontario through this that connects labs at academic health science centers, private labs, and otherwise, uh, as we've been developing and building this. And, you know, again, when I look at the remarkable change that's happened since March, yes, there's been a lot of discussion about some of the challenges with it. But it is truly uh, quite remarkable, the change that has occurred to cope with the volume of tests that we're seeing. Um, I think one uh, example that we're particularly proud of in this region is the development of regional testing capacity at Grand River through our joint lab. Um, you know, yeah, now today we're processing 1,344 tests a day at that lab. 
um, and we've really prioritized directing uh, tests from within the region, certainly within the region of Waterloo, but also extending up to Wellington uh, to ensure that people can get timely test results. And really proud to say that has made a, a big difference, being able to get that lab fully up and functioning. Um, and right now, as of yesterday, we had 16 hour turnaround rates uh, through that for tests that were coming through that labs. And that's going to help us all respond. And it's going to help our public health colleagues be able to respond more nimbly as well. Um, but this system that is in place is really, we try to improve it as we go. There wasn't a time not too long ago, actually, where our turnaround rates for this region were, were, were worse than a lot of other areas in the province. But working through that uh, system, we optimized some of the routing and it allowed us to really ensure that we got the regional testing capability locally set up. So, you know, really that I, I wanted to just provide that overview, uh, provide a comprehensive sense of what the strategy is. Um, you know, again, I, I can't un underscore enough. We are part of a, a testing uh, strategy that exists here. Really. It's connected to Ontario Health West and it's connected provincially as well. Um, and certainly our frontline providers and those that have kind of stepped up to the challenge with the sense where we've really created a whole new service uh, within the region that we'll need to maintain as we go through wave two. And with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, Bruce uh, and, and Dr. Wong, I'll invite any additional comments that you want to make, um, but we'll be happy to take any questions. So thank you very much, Lee and Dr. Wong. Um, I'll now put it up to the health board for questions. Um, please use your icon and raise your hand if you have questions. Do we have any questions, Tim? Okay, uh, Councillor Jaworski, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much through the chair to Dr. Wong. Um, you mentioned positivity rates and those being uh, around 1 to 1.1 percent now. Um, previously it was at 1.2 percent. However, um, w when we were testing before, anybody and everybody could get a test whether they had symptoms or not. And now we're only doing symptomatic testing. So I was just wondering, is that a relevant piece? Does that show that our positivity rates are actually going lower or um, is that a bit of a red herring where people, we don't know how many people were asymptomatic before and we actually don't know how many people are just, uh, you know, winking and saying, yeah, I have sniffles, I need to test. Dr. Wong? Uh, yes, thanks for the question. So um, what we found provincially is that um, when you test asymptomatic people that are not at higher risk because, for example, they haven't been exposed to, to, or haven't been in close contact with a case or are not part of an outbreak facility, then the chances of finding someone who is positive are really, really low. And in fact, uh, just yesterday, the province said uh, the, the percent positivity at, at pharmacies who, who are testing the asymptomatic people who need to get tested um, is about 0.3%. So it's, it's, it's low. Uh, so what you would expect actually uh, when um, testing becomes more focused on symptomatic people um, and people that are asymptomatic but who are at greater risk because they're you know either part of an outbreak or have been in close contact with a case, you would actually expect the percent positivity to increase. So what we saw with our percent positivity was we saw low rates during the summer um, when you know it was open to e everyone and anyone um, who wanted a test. And then beginning in September, as we were seeing cases go up in our region, the percent positivity increased from about 0.5 at the beginning of September to about 1.2. Um, you know, towards the end of September. And more recently, um, it's sort of fluctuated uh, between one and, and 1.1 or 1.2, and it hasn't continued to increase. So that's actually a good sign. Um, overall, that's a sign that's consistent with the fact that our rates did go up, but at this point, they are not on this accelerating path that some other regions have been on. And so, 
Um, yeah, so I, 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 I don't think there's been, um, um, overall, I don't think there's been a negative in impact uh, with the change in the testing guidance. In fact, I think it's been a positive development because we are now able to um, ensure that testing for people who, who need to be tested um, is more available and can be done quicker. Thank, Thank you very you much. And just to the clerk that I'll have to disappear at uh, 10 o'clock for another appointment. Okay. Lee, did you want to add to that? Okay. Thank you, Councillor Jaworski. Councillor Clark. Uh, thank you, Chair. A uh, question for Dr. Wong. And my question is about uh, gyms and, and fitness facilities, but I suppose it could be it could be about any any number of, of businesses. I'm concerned about the potential for closure because I know how important um, people who use gyms find the ability to do so for their physical and mental health. And especially with um, winter coming and the ability to exercise, you know, outside decreasing. I would hate to see us lose that. I know the, um, the the closures that have happened have been by provincial order. What I'm wondering about is the um, the ability of of uh, public health um, locally to order closures in businesses where there are outbreaks without it having to be a blanket class closure. Mm -hmm. Because I know that Jim their businesses, um, some follow all of the suggestions that, that you've made and have not had cases and others um, you know, don't for various reasons. So, so is there a possibility of closing certain um, businesses and, and not all of them? Uh, yes, thanks for the question, Councillor Clark. And yes, local public health does have the ability when we feel it's warranted uh, to close individual businesses. Um, so usually um, what happens though is if there's a risk situation and uh, we communicate that to the business, then they themselves will um, take the, take the um, uh, you know, cl close themselves, um, you know, especially if we let them know, well, if you don't, well, we will have to close you. Um, so um, that can happen from time to time if we encounter um, uh, elevated risk situations associated with a facility. Uh, so yes, uh, the, the, the broad based uh, closures across sectors is uh, generally something that the province um, would have the most jurisdiction to do. Okay. Councillor Clark, you. do you have another question? No, that's fine, thanks. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Vivanovich. Chair Redmond, um, and thank you uh, to uh, both uh, uh, Dr. Wong and to uh, to Lee Fairclough for um, your presentations and, and the work of your teams. Just a couple of questions. Um, Dr. Wong, yesterday the province announced that uh, dance schools were going to be able to, to reopen. Um, I, I wasn't aware that we hadn't reopened them in, in, in the region uh, or hadn't heard any complaints about it are is there much that we need to do now in order to respond to that um to to facilitate that dr wong um yeah no they i i understand it was just decided yesterday um so i i will check in with our with our team that connects with our business community but uh, at, at this time i haven't heard any concerns about that um yeah, they'll be if if they were, um, you know that um, one of the things to be remember is what 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 the province um, announced was really specific to those areas where they have been closed. So that's that's Toronto, Peel, Ottawa, New York. So they other places haven't other places haven't had their fitness gym or dance uh, facilities close. Okay, sorry, I missed that that it was only in those areas so that's probably why we didn't hear complaints about it around <laughs> uh, around here um to uh to lee my, you mentioned that um in waterloo wellington we're doing about 2500 tests a day most of them in, in waterloo um i know this was a question i i had shared um with dr wong previously how do we compare 
in relation to the other districts? Because, like, I, I do believe we're doing better than, than other areas, uh, you know, moderately, as, as Dr. Wong said. And, and, you know, that's thanks to the efforts of everyone, and we need to keep that up. But I also was just wanting to make sure, is our testing level at the same level as other places? Because if it's lower, then presumably the, the numbers that are positive are lower. If it's higher, then we're doing really, you know, we're doing better, actually. Do we have a sense of that in comparison to the other LINs or public health units? Yeah, I think it's a matter of what we target to. So as the province is setting uh, a target, we sort of look at what, you know, what's the proportionate target for us here. And certainly as we moved into the fall, we wanted to at least get to 2,500 and if not beyond that. I think that we, um, you know, generally speaking, I think that we've been able to, to maintain those targets the best we can. With the introduction of the pharmacies, we're trying to get the data that we need to understand the combined uh, amount of testing so we can compare it to where we were before. Um, but, you know, I think overall, we've been doing quite, quite well to maintain, maintain our own targets. I would say the last uh, couple of weeks, particularly as we experienced some of the pressures on the testing centers themselves, we put a lot of focus more so on turnaround times, to be honest, and making sure that those uh, were actually, you know, staying intact and staying at a reasonable pace, particularly those that were high risk contacts or, or symptomatic. Yeah, I know you guys have done some great work on that. But in general, though, we have been yeah. proportionate to those other areas. We have, and I think every once in a while we'll have a dip, or we'll have a we'll we'll say across the centers, you know, are people seeing some some reduction in people coming for testing? You know, we've had to clarify who's eligible for testing, and so when we see those dips, then that usually we sort of reflect to say, well, do we need to be doing a little bit more? But I think so, yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Councillor Armstrong. Yeah, I just uh, have a have a comment, uh, and and this will be for Lee's benefit mostly. Um, I went last week for a test at uh, Westmount, and uh, I just wanted to relate that it was a uh, a positive experience to get a negative result, and uh, that people should be warned that uh, it, it could induce sneezing because I ended up standing in the middle of a room like a puppy who just stuck his nose in a bowl of pepper. So um, that's the only negative part of it uh, that I felt. But I, I just wanted to relate that it was very positive and I would received my results on Monday. So it was, it was very good. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad it was a good experience and glad it was a negative result. <laughs> but I will definitely uh, pass that thanks along to the team if you don't mind that uh, you shared that today. Councillor Armstrong, you, you did paint a picture with the puppy sneezing from the pepper. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Galloway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question to Dr. Wong. In regards to sports activities, is, is the guidance likely to be uh, differentiated by age to any extent? So, um, you know, in relation to let's say hockey um, where maybe old timer hockey should be avoided versus minor hockey where you're dealing with uh, children, you know, under the age of 16. Um, and, and, and part of the concern that I have is in Toronto, the uh, Greater Toronto Hockey League has suspended all its operations. So that's the minor hockey organization responsible for all of uh, Toronto's minor hockey. So they suspended all, all uh, operations because of uh, COVID, but what has happened instead is a whole bunch of outlaw leagues have developed um, and they're less likely to be following um, good public health guidelines. So I'm just concerned that sometimes uh, good intentions sometimes are thwarted by um, the, uh, the community. Not would that happen here? I don't know. Um, but it, but when it comes to sports activities generally, is there a differentiation between uh, those that involve youth and those that involve uh, adults? I haven't heard 
of anything that may be coming like that. But I, I do know provincially um, and, and locally as well, you know, we see situations where um, people are, are playing and they're, you know, following the rules. Um, but then, um, you know, after the game is over, they get together <laughs> and they don't really follow the rules or, or sometimes even when they're playing, um, you know, they, they, even though they're trying, the, the rules are you try to maintain distance. Um, people don't necessarily stick to that all the time. And because they're exercising and they don't wear masks while they're exercising, that increases the risk. So it's, it's, it's more um, both, you know, on and off the ice, so to speak. Uh, it, it, it's more uh, the fact that, you know, there can be rules in place, but a people need to stick to them, you know, while they're playing at all times, especially since masks can't always be worn and to even outside of 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 um, the games if people are together they have to be extremely careful and uh you know not let up their guard and start so it's kind of socializing after the game for instance uh, closely together you know without masks still so it's it's th that kind of 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 risk that uh we've been seeing across the province and locally here as well you know, uh, so so those are sort of, you know, the key pieces of advice that, that I would give. But, you know, your point is well taken that sometimes if you do make something no longer available officially where where there are more rules and more supervision uh, that's happening, you can inadvertently, you know, um, create other situations where people are, are, are doing it outside of... Um, of areas where there's monitoring. So, um, yeah, um, you know, it, it, it is something to, to, so, you know, that really just emphasizes, we do want to try to keep where we can activities going, sports fitness activities, um, but with uh, the appropriate precautions. And, uh, you know, it, it, potentially there could be some more, in particular what the province has is potentially potentially uh, an up, uh, updated guidance for for gym and, and, and fitness facilities um, just because of the of the of the outbreak and other risk situations that they've seen. Councillor Galloway, do you have further questions? No, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Shantz. Thank you. I have I have um Two questions, but first, I just want to comment on the collaboration that we've seen in in Waterloo Region, and I, you know, I think people don't always uh, realize the effort that that takes, but um, the outcomes are so much better, and I think that's what we're seeing because of the collaboration from and so. My thanks to everyone on this meeting, and actually to the whole community for how they've responded. Um, two questions, one for Lee and one for Dr. Wong. Um, different testing methods. Um, so I've had I've had six COVID tests. Um, I've had the brain tickler and I've had the nasal massage, and I yeah, I think I've had three different kinds of testing. Um, can you just talk a wee bit about? the accuracy of them and and sort of um, how, how do we how are we supposed to look at that and and um, yeah it, is there a difference and does that matter so and my second question okay. to dr. Wong is about Halloween great so Lee do you want to talk about testing and then dr. Wong can um, join in and then address Halloween as well yeah, I mean, I think that Dr. Wong may be in a better position on the uh, the accuracy of the different tests okay. for the current science. So maybe I'll turn it to her. Um, so um, the uh, nasal pharyngeal uh, test, the one that you know, um, uh, Councillor Armstrong talked about receiving, that is considered the gold standard. Um, so you know, that has the best sensitivity, specificity, et cetera, uh, for, for people for whom it's indicated. Um, it, it doesn't work so well with asymptomatic people 
that don't, they're not really at risk, but that's just, that's the case for any test. And in fact, the other tests are available are not quite as good, um, but you know, there, um, there's a, there's a balance that the province wants to strike between being enough <laughs> um, for the specific indications that they're um, targeting um, and uh, you know uh, being being available so the test that you get in pharmacies is is, 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 a, is, is, is a is a bit of a different test uh, it's not the gold standard but it is pretty good uh, and it's felt that it's good enough for that population that they're targeting which is asymptomatic people um, you know with 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 less risk overall um, so um, in terms, so those are the types of tests that are currently available: the nasal pharyngeal swab and the and the and the nasal swab at, at pharmacies. So those are, you know, overall very good tests. There obviously has been a lot of talk about tests that uh, you know hopefully will become available in the future, um, such as um, you know tests where you can uh, what they call swish and gargle in your mouth. Um, and that has, you know, um, started in BC uh, for school children. And I understand Ontario is, uh, is in the process of uh, trying to make that available as quickly as possible and likely targeted for, for populations like school children first. So that's going to be a bit of an easier test, likely for, for, for children to, to tolerate. Um, and, and there's other tests we've heard about, right? Um, antigen tests, uh, point of care tests, et cetera, just different names. And sometimes people use them interchangeably when they're not really supposed to be used interchangeably. But anyways, it's a rapidly evolving field. And um, I, I do know that the province is working quickly, as quickly as they can to try to make some of these more readily available. But I would say that in general, you know, if new tests become available, they'll likely be available for certain populations first because they probably won't be broadly available to everyone right away. And then, um, you know, over time, uh, they'll probably expand to more populations. So the, the good news is it's being worked on and, um, you know, it's, it's my hope that we'll hear about um, uh, additional methods of testing in the next few months. And uh, you know uh, who who this additional testing will be available for. So I don't know if Lee would want to add anything to that, but this is kind of in in, in general, um, you know, an, an area of great interest, great activity at the provincial level uh, to 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 approve more tests and to make them more widely available. Councillor Schantz okay. also wanted to ask a question about Halloween. Yes, correct. Yes, so your question about Halloween. Yeah, I mean, basically, um, will you? You've given a, few, you've given sort of some guidelines, I think, in the past. But are are we uh, going to expect any further guidelines or any further um, um, restrictions? Maybe not restrictions, but um, will you have anything different to say, or can people sort of uh, rest to that? Uh, what, what they've heard is is where we're gonna land on October 31st. Yeah, I, I think that to what we've heard is where we're gonna land uh, on October 31st. Uh, the, the, the province, you know, also released guidelines yesterday for, for, for the province, uh, you know, for areas like Toronto, Peel, um, Ottawa and York, but also for the rest of the province. And they, they do align with, our, with the local guidance um, that was, uh, um, issued a little earlier. And uh, basically it's guidance around what people can do uh, to lower their risk um, if they choose to participate in, in Halloween activities. So I think that guidance will remain the same uh, from now until Halloween appears. Thanks. Um, could someone send me uh, uh, like a written description of those guidelines? I was going to reference that at our council meeting tonight. So if someone has those readily available, I guess I could go through old emails and find it. But if someone else has it more readily available, I'd appreciate that. Mr. Lochner is happy to weigh in here. Yeah. What, 
We'll definitely resend that, and um, it was shared with your CAOs and communicators last week as well, but we'll send that directly to, to council. Is that, does that suffice, Councillor Schantz? Yes, that's great. Thanks a lot. So I see Councillor Foxton is ready for her question. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and to Dr. Wong, um, and again, to, to uh, Lee Fairchild and Sharon Ball, you guys do an amazing job, and I'm so honored and proud that you're sitting with us and inviting us and helping us along the way. Uh, I have a couple of things. Number one is, I have, believe it or not, I have a person on the phone right now wanting to know about outdoor sporting events. And what are the regulations for an event and um, how is it managed or whatever? Can you update me on that, um, Dr. Wong? Yeah, so for, for our region, there haven't really been any changes um, provincially to the regulations about outdoor uh, sports events. So they're the, 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 the same as other regions that are still in stage three of the, of the reopening. Um, what um, what I'm what what I was sort of saying today was um, my advice uh, because we have seen seen some issues uh, across the province. We've seen outbreaks across the province, and here, although we haven't had outbreaks yet in those settings, we've seen some risk situations. Um, and and so because of that, you know, in general, outdoors is safer than indoors, and it, it's good to try to. Um, orient activities if we can uh, to outdoor settings. But the other thing I would say is um, whether you're playing, e even if you're playing um, outdoors, be, be careful, whatever you do, try to maintain at all times six feet or more distance from other players and, um, you know, uh, try to minimize the size of the group that you're playing with. Um, because those those things will will help reduce the the risk and minimize the chance for for outbreaks, um, including off the ice or, or 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 when you're no longer playing and you're just getting together, it's it's really recommended that you be very very careful in those situations because oftentimes we've seen people let their guard down. You know they're playing with friends, they're playing with people they they know with, and they they've had a game and they want to celebrate. Then they end up just gathering together and being in close contact, uh, you know, drinking or, or, or celebrating and then not no longer sort of following that the guidance, which is you still have to stick to the six feet apart and you should be wearing masks anytime that you can wear masks. Thank you. Um, one other question, if I may, um, or a comment. In North Dumfries in air, the pocket of air, we appear on that dashboard as if you don't record under five cases right so yeah. it appears white so the assumption in my community is that we have no problem with COVID and so people are saying we don't count so we can do basically what we want and I'm having more and more problems with this could you please state the number of cases in air and because North Dumfries does have cases but not air and so people are assuming that we're immune um, unfortunately, if it's below five, I can't really do that. Um, it, these are these are very um, these are very strict privacy rules. Uh, we, we we public health does need to ensure that uh, you know we, we 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 protect privacy, and this is generally um, um, generally accepted that when you are going down below. A regional level into an area municipal level, especially mm -hmm. down to a small um, area, you, um, you don't release um, numbers below five. So, um, you know, I, I just think it's 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 um, you know important to, to just remember. I, I understand what you're trying to say, and you know, you're trying to <laughs> trying to support the messaging um, to, to 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 everyone in your in, in your community that everyone does remain at risk. Even if the, the the case numbers are lower in township areas, we do see that across Ontario they are lower, but it doesn't mean that the that um, the risk the people don't have to take those precautions um, because it, it it can easily spread, um, you know, once once someone has it and they can pass it on to family and friends. Yeah, and, and 
And if I could try and explain, I'm getting a lot of backlash. And I'm getting a lot of backlash from, believe it or not, medical people who say, we don't have it here. We don't have to follow the same rules. Um, and, and it's sort of getting out of hand. I have to, I, I would love to just say, yes, we do have cases here, but they're not buying it. <laughs> and um, I have concerns. I have concerns that we could have problems in the next while if we don't get people to realize that we do have to still real vigilant. So I have two groups now. The groups that are, no, I get three. The staunch, staunch seniors that still won't come out of their homes, even to go for a walk. And I'm going to try and talk to them and say, you know what? Get out for fresh air. Social distance. Take your mask, but get out for a walk or something. And the, uh, the middle of the road group, which is like us, where we follow the rules, the regulations, but we go out wearing our mask and social distance. Mm -hmm. And now the group that's getting quite large is the group that says, we've got nothing here. We don't have to worry. So they're doing basically the hell they want. And, and that's my fear is they're going to start to spread. And I and because I can't say to them, yes, we do have cases. And they'll say, the dashboard says we're white. We're clear. And I'm going, yes, but that because it doesn't record anything under five. So they said, well, tell me, do we have anything under five? And I said, I can't tell you. So again, I'm at that dilemma where we, and we've been white for a long, long time. They really believe we don't have any problem. So I guess so any, way, any way you can help, I'd appreciate it. Counselor Fox, and one of the, the um, messaging yes. points that um, Dr. Wong has been making for a long time, and I know back when um, Mr. Murray and I were participating in, in the briefing was to say to everybody, assume the threat exists everywhere because it does. And very few people live, work, and never go outside of their corner of the region. So we have cases where people that live in the townships that work elsewhere have um, actually um, tested positive because they work in, in other townships or other counties. So it, it is fluid and um, people just need to recognize that, that it is a clear and present danger within the community in every corner. And I know that doesn't make your job easier when they're not showing up on the dashboard, but that really has been consistent messaging throughout this entire pandemic. And more so than ever, I would tell you now that we're into phase two. I don't know, Dr. Wong or Lee, if you want to add to that. I just wanted to say that's an excellent point because, um, you know, uh, the, um, the, the conventional way to, um, to show the cases when you show them by neighborhood or area municipality is where they live. But uh, oftentimes people can get the infection at their place of work or other settings. And so... Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's not necessarily where you live. And so that's, that's the very good point, uh, uh, Chair Redman, that, um, you know, even someone who lives in the townships uh, could be at risk because um, they are working or socializing um, in other areas. But overall, the, there, there, there's risk everywhere. It's, it's not a virus that, you know, decides okay, they won't visit a particular area of the province. Um, it, it, it's everywhere, but it, it's, it's, um, it is um, true that obviously if you have more people in a certain area, you're gonna have greater chances of, 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 of seeing infection. Yes, and I'll keep doing the message, but they're not buying it. Well, the only thing I would add is I think we have seen this not just in Ontario, but we've seen this around the world. So our public health measures are, are proving to be effective in some, you know, in how we're doing relative to other places. And so, you know, in some ways, maybe that community is, you know, the fact that they have been doing them is helping them. And, and I think that we have seen communities let off and we've seen cases rise. So, you know, it's the classic uh, public health. When public health is most effective, you actually aren't affected by what you're trying to protect against. And, uh, you know, I think that's the same here, you know, and, and it becomes harder and harder to maintain, but it does work. We saw it in the first wave. It, especially, you know, speaking from somebody who works in the health system, to be able to protect that capacity so that we can continue to deliver healthcare, other healthcare services is just so critical. So, 
That would be the only thing I would say. <laughs> I'll keep trying. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Herb. Uh, thank you um, uh, for this um, information. Uh, my question is, is to Lee, um, and it relates to the, um, the, the results and the lab um, turnaround. D did I understand correctly that all of the testing that's happening now in Waterloo, Wellington, we're able to produce those results ourselves. And, and we, like a week or two ago, there was this report of about 82,000 lab tests that weren't available. Is our capacity um, in-house now to, to um, produce everything? So we, we, we wouldn't be able to do all tests in the region here currently at the, that's specific to the GRH, the Grand River Hospital uh, location lab. That's about 1,344 tests a day. Um, and then we rely on other labs in the, in the region and the province. Um, that, the, the full use of the GRH lab now, what we are doing there is ensuring that tests that are symptomatic tests or high priority to make sure we turn around quickly, we're, we're making sure that they are di directed to that lab. But no, we wouldn't be able to meet all of our testing uh, requirements in the region. We do have to route to other labs um, and we work with Life Labs and, and other labs as well to support all of those testing needs. But I think what's been, what's been new is that we've been really wanting to ensure a rapid turnaround for those tests that we really need the results on quickly. Uh, and just as a follow-up, um, so th like for the, the rapid testing, as I understand it, after um, you've been tested, um, the, the it, it expires in three days. Uh, um, is there a percent that um, of how we know that um, translates back into the region? Oh, that's a good question. I don't have that number top of hand uh, okay. uh, right now, but um, it is certainly something that we we try to to limit and avoid. We did have some examples of that very early on in the region where we had sent tests out of the region to be processed that needed to be rerouted and they extended beyond that time. So then we worked again very rapidly to make sure that that wouldn't occur again. Um, so I don't have the specific percentage uh, to give you right now, but I usually hear about them. So <laughs> I haven't heard about them recently. <laughs> Dr. Wong? I'll just quickly add, Councillor Herb. So um, the uh, backlog, provincial backlog, has uh, very significantly reduced. Um, so we're, I, I, I think we're, um, I think there's there's very little backlog right now. There's always a certain amount apparently that's that's considered normal, and I think they're close to the normal range now, if if, if not already in the normal range. And we've also noticed that in terms of what we're hearing, um, our turnaround times here, uh, it, you know. It, it, partly because of the Grand River St. Mary's lab, but but also because the provincial backlog has decreased very significantly, those turnaround times have greatly improved here in the region as well. Good, good, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lorenz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first of all, I wanna thank uh, Bruce for making sure that uh, we had this meeting in the morning to get us up to speed on what's going on. I do have some questions though, of, of clarification. I guess the first thing is, I'm wondering if we're going to get a copy of the slide deck, uh, Dr. Wong, that you sent us or, or that you showed earlier, because there's some good information on there. But I still struggle with the idea of the province gives us uh, provincial guidelines, say, for example, for Halloween, and yet uh, the, all the different municipalities in the region are doing different things. So I was at my daughter's house yesterday, and my three grandkids came home from school, and the first thing they asked me is, what's going on? For Halloween, have you heard anything? Like, I don't think the school boards know. They can't advise children there. Um, we don't seem to be advising everybody. We put out these very vague guidelines. So in, in my research, it looks like Kitchener is allowing Halloween. Waterloo is not. Cambridge isn't. Wilmot is. North Dumfries isn't. Will Wellesley isn't. And Woolwich isn't. And I think if we're all operating under the same guidelines, why isn't there some consistency in our message? I mean, one of the things we talk about, you mentioned earlier, is outside is safer than inside. The provincial guideline for Halloween says uh, um, only trick or treat outside. Wear a face covering. Costume mask is not a substitute. Wash your hands or use hand sanitizers. Um, avoid gatherings with those outside your household. I mean, these are all kind of common sense, sense things that... Uh, 
you know, children supervised by an adult, so there should be really no problem with that. So how do we get the same consistent message across the region to everyone? And are we also advising the school boards as to what our stand is, um, which we're saying you can't go out, just, just make sure you meet these measures. But it seems to me some municipalities are not allowing it. I don't know how you can not have Halloween in the city of Waterloo or or uh, in Cambridge, because people will probably, based on tradition and safe, safe rules, safe guidelines, will do it anyway. So how do we all get on board? So Mr. Lochner is going to weigh in on this one, Councillor Lorenz. I think a couple of It's like Star Trek. Yeah. You'd think after a couple months I'd know how to use this. Take that up in my performance review. <laughs> so a couple of things. On the guidance, we've been or tried to be clear that the guidance that the medical officer provides is independent advice. So as an example, last week, Dr. Wong provided on the 13th independent medical officer of health advice. And that was provided in a couple of ways. We provided it through our community pandemic control group to all participants. So that's to um, the school boards, to the universities, to the colleges, to uh, area municipalities, to business and so on. Um, and that information that was then provided to this council um, in the form of the newsletter. So the same recommendations, that's independent medical officer advice. And the advice talks about how to lower your risk and gives alternatives to traditional trick-or-treating. And the independent advice also says, recognizing some people may not heed that advice um, and want to trick-or-treat. If you do choose to trick-or-treat, here's my medical advice. And I know I'm speaking for you, Dr. Wong. Um, here's my medical advice. Um, you then get the federal chief medical officer of health providing guys advice for the country. And I've received a number of communications from residents saying the chief medical officer of Canada said um, Halloween is fine. That's not what the chief medical officer of Canada said. She said Halloween can continue, in her view, safely, except in certain areas where there may be a higher prevalence of COVID. And in those individual municipalities, it's super important to heed the advice from the local medical officer of health and local, local health authorities. And that was the chief medical officer's way of saying things may be different in Quebec or in parts of Ontario than they may be in, in say, another province. And then within Ontario, the chief medical officer gave advice for certain areas of the provinces, as Dr. Wong talked about, like Peel and Toronto and Ottawa, where the advice from the chief medical officer is, is don't do traditional health. So then we break down to the region of Waterloo, and Dr. Wong has given advice that here's some alternatives, but if you do choose to have Halloween, um, here's some safe ways to do that. Um, Dr. Wong may want to weigh in, and then to Councillor Lorenz's question, then each municipality may take that advice and say, in our geography within the region, um, here's what we're going to do differently than perhaps another geography. But I'll, I'll, I'll have to leave that to the, the area municipalities to comment. Doc, Dr. Wong, do you have anything to comment on uh, in addition to what I said or correct anything that I said? No, no everything you said was, was perfect. Uh, uh, Bruce, uh, you know, I was just wondering if maybe... Uh, some people on our communications team who are on a call with us might have some things to add, but I know they've been working um, hard to, to keep our partners, including our municipal partners, uh, informed. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I see Julie and Brian have uh, showed their screen, so I'll maybe leave it to them. So Brian well, looks unmuted. Clear. Let's go to Brian and then to Julie. And yeah, maybe I'll start and I'll turn over to Julie. Um, we think, did share uh, that information with our... Uh, Brian, uh, just a second control group last week, and uh, it was widely circulated. And I think it, it was up to the uh, uh, Air Municipalities to interpret that uh, as they as they should. But I'll turn it over to Julie. Go ahead, Julie. Uh, not much more to add to that. We've shared it with the communicators and continue to work with them and provide support if they have questions. Um, from a public health perspective, we'll continue to share the health messages uh, via social media and also through Shuli's briefings. 
Thank you. Councilor Lorenz, does that answer your question? No, it does, no, it does not answer my question. So it, the, the information I have is that Kitchener is allowing it, Waterloo is not. Is that true? Do we know that? Not, not correct. If I can jump in, Madam Chair. Okay. Okay, go ahead, Councilor Vervanovic. Uh, so, so to be clear, um, the city of Kitchener uh, issued a media state or uh, media release on Friday um, built on the messaging from Dr. Wong and if anything actually went a little more cautious uh, and the specific uh, the specific messaging is as much as we all love Halloween we know it look it needs to look different this year because of COVID-19 we're encouraging our communities ghosts and goblins to celebrate with individual or other safely organized alternatives that keep public health guidelines top of mind. Um, we are doing some drive-through uh, events uh, that will be taking place, um, but we're certainly not encouraging people going door to door. But uh, again, as Mr. Uh, Lochner indicated, that's individual people's choices, and uh, that's the that's the challenge right now. Councillor Renz. Well, I don't know how you're going to, yeah, I, and I agree. I guess what I was looking for is some um, consistency in the municipalities. We can put all the warnings and all the concerns that we have out there, but I don't know. I mean, are we going to start arresting people at our, at our trick-or-treating uh, because they're out? Are we going to have a curfew? I mean, like, I don't know. Why, why can't we just have a consistent message so everybody understands? It seems pretty clear to me that... Um, well, listening to Councillor Fox and people seem to believe that there's no concerns at all. And I think the solution for that is uh, common sense. But I think taking the proper precautions, I don't see a problem with uh, with parents going out. And even if it's just a couple of, of, of on your street or close friends, but I, it just, I don't know. We're the region. We should be having a consistent message across all seven municipalities. And it doesn't seem happening that way. And we still have 11 days to try to fix that, in my view. The next question I have is, um, I think on the slide deck, you talked about in studios being uh, are now being closed. Is that right, Dr. Wong? No. No, no, no sorry. Um, no. Um, the province announced that uh, in the areas where they have been closed, which is not our area, which, sorry, which does not include our area, so in areas like Toronto, Peel, Ottawa, and York, they they were closed and they they're now allowed to reopen. Okay, and so that, would that include like indoor soccer and indoor basketball for? So so that's already still allowed in Waterloo Region because Waterloo Region remains in stage three; it hasn't moved back like those other areas. Um, so that's still allowed. So every year I usually get my shot uh, uh, before our community services committee, but we haven't had that in eight or nine months. Um, so now I'm trying to go to Shoppers Drug Mart to get my my flu vaccine shot. And there seems to be a shortage across the province. Um, can you give us an up, any update on that? Um, is there, why is there a shortage and how soon will that be resolved? Um, I think people that want to get a, flu shot should be able to get a flu shot and the only reason it seems right now is because there's no vaccine available in the region anyway yeah so um there has been across the province including in the region an increased demand for um flu vaccine earlier on and um the province is aware of this and they have overall ordered more vaccine for the for the entire province, including all the areas. And we get a proportional amount, you know, compared to other areas, um, but it's not all available right now. So there's shipment coming in as we speak uh, from the province who delivers directly to the pharmacy. So it's not something public health is in involved in. Um, it goes direct to the pharmacies and um, you know, it, it, it they will be uh, they will have further supply uh, in you know, in the in the coming few weeks. So it's just it's not all available all at once, uh, you know. And and people have noticed that because there's been greater demand, which is which is a great thing. Um, so the province is you know uh, 
quickly as they can trying to get that vaccine out. Now, where public health is involved is the distribution of vaccine to long-term care homes and retirement homes. So that's been a priority and that's that's going um, on right now. And also we distribute to the family physicians in Waterloo Region. And similarly, um, there, are, um, there, there are amounts the province has given us, which is in line with, you know, um, what we as a region have, have given in the past and, and, and proportionate to our population and such. And those amounts are going out to, to family physicians, but like the pharmacies, it's not all going out at once because the shipment has, there's not all the vaccines been available right away. So the shipments are continuing to come in. And as we get more, we'll be able to distribute more to the family practices. Um, but yeah, we are seeing a greater demand for the, uh, for the, for the flu vaccine uh, right away. But that, that, but that demand can be accommodated in the in the the province is saying it can be accommodated in the next few weeks. Councilor Lorenz, any more questions? Much. I also want to thank you you and your team for the great work you've done. I mean, it's um, it's just uh, every day brings something different. So uh, um, I, I think people in our community that think we're out of the woods, uh, there's no possible way that we are. We're doing quite well. We're holding our own. And the only reason that is happening is because everybody's being cautious and they're taking extra steps to make sure they're safe. And uh, I hope that continues in the townships as well, because we're all in this together and people are transient. I know, I know people that work in all the townships and vice versa. So we need to, um, we need to keep hammering that message home that we are all near in this together and we all need to protect each other, including our children. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Lorenz. Councillor Nowak. Yeah, just uh, um, a comment uh, with regard to uh, Councillor uh, Foxton's uh, concerns about uh, um, the dashboard showing up white on uh, on a regular basis. Um, Councillor Foxton, you could reference what's, hap what's been happening in Wellesley Township because uh, from the onset uh, of that uh, dashboard, we've been white uh, throughout. In the last two weeks, that has changed. So the northern part of, of Wellesley now is showing uh, uh, eight cases. Uh, it seems every time I look, they're adding one more to it. So things can change in a heartbeat. And I think maybe that's the message that uh, that you may want to uh, send to your, uh, your constituents. Um, and it's a concern for us. So uh, the other thing I was wondering about uh, a, a question, uh, there hasn't been any deaths that I'm aware of recently. Uh, thank goodness. Um, uh, have we found a better way of treating those that have uh, the COVID uh, virus? Uh, is that one of the reasons why the death count is, is lower now? Um, and why, you know, that people aren't as many, not as many people are being hospitalized? Is that, we've just found a better way of treat, treating it? Dr. Wong? Uh, yeah, thanks for the question, Councillor Nowak. Um, so uh, we haven't found any effective treatments yet for, for COVID, but... You know, uh, clinicians, um, I think, with their experience treating COVID patients in hospitals, um, you know, th there's th there's been some incremental improvements, I, I believe, in terms of supporting them um, as as they, um, uh, you know, as their bodies uh, fight the virus. The reason we're not seeing as many uh, deaths is because right now it's affecting primarily younger people. Um, but um, what we've noticed in Ontario already, and we're starting to notice here as well, is that uh, it's starting to bleed into other age groups as well, including the older age groups uh, and uh, those that are more vulnerable. And so what we've seen is we've seen hospitalizations start to gradually increase. And usually, deaths are what's called the lagging indicator. So what you'll see is you'll see cases first, then you'll see hospitalizations, and then you'll see deaths. So it comes later, it comes even several weeks later. So, um, so I don't think we will see the amount of deaths we saw in the first wave if it doesn't affect the long-term care homes and retirement homes as much as it did in the in the in the um, first wave, but it is still something that we have to be careful about because there is um, you know greater numbers 
uh, now going into the, the groups that are older, we're seeing that also with our um, gradual increases in the number of long-term care homes and retirement homes that are getting infected. And um, they, they um, sorry, that, that are, that are um, having cases and then becoming in uh, outbreaks. And, you know, it's, it's something that um, we have to be extremely careful about because we know that in those settings, um, it can very, very easily spread. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, it's a good thing we haven't seen as many deaths to, to today, but it's, it's not something to, um, to, to indicate that there is no, that there, that there is no threat. Uh, that there are signs that, um, you know, any time, the, the key thing to remember is any time our community rates start to increase, there will be in the weeks after an increase in hospitalizations and, and an increase in, in, in deaths. So we have to just try to keep our community rates overall low. Councillor Nowak, do you have any further questions? No, thank you very much. And thank you for everything that you're doing. It's much appreciated. Thank you, uh, Councillor Vervanovich. Sorry, that was on. That was still on from uh, before, and then I jumped in uh, to uh, answer Councillor Lorenz's question. Okay, thank you. So, um, uh, Public Board of Health colleagues, um, I see no more questions. Um, I guess, Dr. Wong, one of the questions I would have asked coming out of um, Councillor Lorenz's line of questioning is, what do people do with children who are under five years old to get the flu shot? I think that's an important piece of public health advice. Um, yes, yeah, so they can um, um, they can get it from their um, primary care practitioner, or we are also holding um, clinics uh, uh, um, for 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 families with uh, children under five. So, uh, and how would they go on the public uh, health website and sign up for that, or um, to find out the times or make an appointment? How does that mechanism work? Uh, yes, that's correct. Um, they would. Um, they, they would go to, to sign up. And I think what we can do is we can, uh, looking at my communications uh, colleagues, but I think we can, um, you know, continue to promote that um, through our various um, communication channels at the region. So, so people are aware. Julie, do you want to jump in or did Dr. Wong cover it? Okay, that's great. Um, Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate um, the information. Um, I appreciate the interest. And I guess sort of the take home message to some of the question is that actually public health has been very consistent with its mes messaging. Um, there are uh, different um, bodies, whether they're area municipalities or the school boards, and they will interpret that messaging um, however they will, but that the messaging coming out from public health um, and Dr. Wong his, and her colleagues has been very consistent. So thank you for that guidance. Um, I would, and I thank Dr. Uh, Wong as well as Lee Fairclough for uh, taking this time to um, provide the B Board of Public Health with this kind of information. And I would now entertain a motion to adjourn. It's moved by Councillor Lorenz and seconded by Councillor Kiefer. So if you'd please use your icon buttons for yes or no to vote. Thank you, colleagues. That motion is uh, carried and we are adjourned. Thank you. Great job, uh, Karen. Thank you. Hi, guys. Have a good day. Bye. Have a great day. Thank Bye. You. Dave. You too. Thanks, everybody.